Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Pineapple Podcast, a Cherry Creek Innovation Campus production. We're your hosts. My name's Morgan. And I'm Nate Barrett. Today, we have the ple- pleasure of talking with Chef Matt Warnerlin, who's an executive chef at the Ball Arena in Denver, Colorado. Although originally from Germany, you've worked all over the world in Australia and America now. Um, and he's going to share some of his experience and everything that can help you uh, build up your experience in the hospitality and the culinary industry. How are you doing today? Good morning. How are you guys? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Good. How about you, Nate? I'm doing just fine, Morgan. Thank <laughs> you for asking. So a question, because I know you work at the Ball Arena. I have to ask, are you a bigger hockey fan or are you more into basketball? Soccer. Soccer. <laughs> I'm oh German. No. Of course. Yeah. Football. <laughs> Real <laughs> football. That's, that's yeah. there you go. Now, if I have to decide between hockey and basketball, definitely hockey. But I mean, if the Avs play, we're hockey fans. And if the yeah. Avs play, we're basketball fans. So, yeah. I mean, it's your job. You can't pick favorites, right? Exactly. So, so whatever yeah. building you're in, you're a fan of the team. So, yeah, I get that. Um, so, I know you grew up in Germany. And I remember you talking about how the schooling there is different. You went to, is it high school? And then you go into like a more designated career field? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you go, you do high school and then and depending of if you want to go to like a four-year college, or if you want to go to a trade school, it's kind of like two different paths. And then they kind of send you to the department of labor and you do an assessment, like a personality assessment and what your interests are and then they pretty much tell you they give you free choices of uh what you'd be suited for for an apprenticeship and for me it was chef florist and then something else i don't remember the florist, third That's florist pretty, yeah. pretty different um yeah. and then and then once you decide what you want to do you usually do like a a week like an internship internship somewhere see if you like it and then you start applying for your apprenticeship positions which is like a re- regular job interview and then you work for four days a week in a hotel or restaurant which is qualified to take on apprentices and then one one day a week you go to college or trade school right where you have like all different classes like culinary french and math and obviously cooking classes etc so once you're done with that after three years you get your d- culinary degree and you already have three years of work experience, obviously, which is a big yeah. plus, right? And then you work your way up the ladder from commis de cuisine, demi-chef, chef de partie, and so on and so on. Wow, so it seems like they help you a lot more than they do in America. That's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, they hook it up. They do, and it's obviously it's all for free because it's government regulated, right? So there's no private schooling in, in Germany or I, I don't believe anywhere in the European Union. So, okay. and it, it goes for every trade. It's not only chef. If you want to work hotel or hospitality from the house, you do your three-year degree. Or if you want to be a car mechanic, or if you want to work in a bank, it's all the same thing. You just go to different trade schools. Nice. That's so cool. And did you always know, did you always know that you wanted to go into hospitality? Or when did you have that big realization? Well, I was, when I did that assessment, I was 16, 17. So I, I don't think I knew much back then, right? So. Yeah. I kind of went with the people, like what they told me, what I'm suited at, and you know, started to love it, you know, because I mean, otherwise you come out of tenth or eleventh grade and you're gonna work as a dishwasher for your rest of your life, or you just go with the flow. So, but it's I I I, I became to love it like quite quite shortly after. I mean, I finished with my apprenticeship when I was like 19, I think, 19 or 20, I was 20. Um, mm-hmm. so but then you have a bit of a clearer vision of what you want to do. And then you can always stack on another apprenticeship if you want, right? You can do your pastry degree after, or you, like if you're already in food service, then so if you want to do your second second apprenticeship, let's say you did your chef apprenticeship and then you want to become a butcher, then it gets cut down to two years, right? So if it's in the same field, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you want to do a baker apprenticeship afterwards, it gets cut down, cut down to two years. And so from your friends, in Germany, do you, does this usually work? Like what, what path they choose? Do people usually ch- kind of go along with what they recommend or? I think so. Uh, from what I've seen from what my circle of friends, like people did an apprenticeship, they most of them stuck with it. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, it's also, you already invested three years of your life. So mm-hmm. you might as well. 
I mean, usually you have to do your, uh, back then it was like you had to do your military service right after because it was compulsory back then. So that kind of gives you another year or two years to think about life in general, right? So, but most of the people seem to be stuck with it, you know, which is good, you know, because you can build up on it too. Then if you have your culinary degree, you didn't, you can do your master chef certification and all that stuff. And that goes for every trade, right? So you can always build on to that. So you can be like a master car mechanic uh, or master baker or whatnot. So, so that's why the BMWs are so good. Well, I'm an Audi guy, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, either one. That's why they're so good, though, because they yeah. got these master mechanics. Yeah, and the thing is, like, you you cannot work. Let's say, let's say, you take BMW. If you don't have a degree in like whatever, like mechatronics or whatnot, or like apprenticeship, you you will not get a job on an assembly line. They just don't hire you because you're not qualified. The same in the kitchen. You cannot just work start working in the kitchen without an without a degree. Right, it's impossible. That's awesome. I think that's, that's great. That Keep that quality yeah. up. Which, which obviously, which obviously puts there's a lot more competition in European kitchens than there is in American kitchens because everybody wants to has the goal to become an executive chef or like a like a head chef in a restaurant at some point in their lives. Nobody is like content with just being a cook, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of competition. It's like a sports team, <laughs> you know. Like sometimes, I like, see it as the minor league teams right in baseball like it's a team but everybody works towards their goal right so yeah definitely a lot of competition going on and how about australia would you say it's the same competition over there or was it because they're not a part of the union right um no australia is but their program or apprenticeship programs is very very similar to european union because they're yeah. pretty well right so they kind of have the same same system as we, as they have in Europe. So same kind of vibe in the kitchens over there. So what and what then, has been your favorite country to cook in? Uh, ooh, Australia is cool. Yeah. Definitely. I worked in Miami for almost 10 years. Miami is a cool spot too. Right. But yeah, Australia is good. Miami's Definitely. a wild spot too, though. It is. And I, I got out of it without any any long-term damage you know? yeah like, <laughs> like sometimes when i go to miami i'm like i can't believe this is even the same country it's like going to las vegas yeah. Yeah, the same. vegas vegas and miami is the same thing yeah That's exactly the and the the hotel i worked in in miami was is definitely a hot spot um for all things miami let's put it that way <laughs> yeah, so, so you you're surrounded a different by, world over yeah there. you're surrounded by miami every day at work right uh, yeah but you kind of get immune to it, you know, yeah. like seeing celebrities or dealing with like high end clients. I mean, everybody wants to eat at the end of the day. So. And everybody yeah, usually loves the So that's why it's never going away. That's they right. They got to eat and they got to they got to have somewhere to sleep. That's right. Hospitality and tourism. Yep. And that's why it's going to come back even after COVID. Like it's even after COVID, it's going to come back. Obviously, it took a hit. But I mean, everybody's always going to need a place to sleep when they're traveling too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like me working in the sports and entertainment industry, I think it's going to come back a lot quicker than because mm. people are just waiting to see games or waiting to see yes. concerts and stuff. Yeah. So, and the turnaround time for us is a little bit quicker than it is, let's say, for large conventions, right? Because they get mm -hmm. planned out so far in advance. Um, yeah. So for us, I, I guarantee you, once once this building gets opened back up, it's going to be a sold out crowd if we allow. Oh yeah. Right, so. Well, yeah, because yeah, people mom. they took it for granted, and now that it's taken away, and for so long, yeah. oh man, they're just going to be yeah. like, I would kill for an Avs game right now or <laughs> some basketball, even though the Nuggets aren't the best. Well, okay. They well, were pretty hype up the state. <laughs> they were a pretty solid team this year. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> That's what um, I was looking for. And I think it's the same thing with restaurants. I mean, restaurants, it's going to be so hard to get reservations for restaurants. Right. Because I oh, yeah. personally, like, even like after this whole, we went back to level red, I believe we're in. Um, I didn't enjoy going out, wearing a mask, and then, you know, like, minim like certain percentage of occupancy and all that. I just didn't enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So I think people are just waiting for it, you know, but I think there's light at the end of the tunnel right now with the vaccines and all that. So mm-hmm. looking forward to that. Give it another few months and we're back to normal, hopefully. Yeah, I'm we're out. out. Here's the hope. And, and you know, if, if, if the one positive that's coming out of this is, I think is people are going to pay a little bit more attention to personal hygiene and like, you know, sanitizing their hands and being mindful of what they touch and when they touch it and et cetera. So I think that's a good thing. I was thinking that same thing as well. I'm hoping at least people come out of here washing their hands and being more mindful. I'm not saying you got to still wear a mask, you know, because I know there's people out there talking about that. Like, oh, I'll just, we're going to keep wearing masks. I don't know about all that, but just, you know, did you ever realize there was this many germs in the air until now? Like, you know, I bet people are like, this whole time, (laughs) I know I am. I'm like, man, coronavirus, COVID-19, you know, and then there's the flu. And no wonder I get sick every year because nobody's wearing a mask and it's just flying everywhere. Nobody was washing their hands before this. But do you see- I think like up until last year, everybody was like, they just ignored it because they didn't think about it a lot because nobody was getting sick on a mass scale. And now everybody's worried about it. And I think that's a good thing, even when COVID's gone. Yeah, and I, you see it in, in Asia. I mean, when I worked in Australia, I've been to quite a few Asian countries and there it's pretty, it's pretty common that people wear masks when they're on public transportation and, and whatnot. So like in the airport and stuff. So that's yeah, what- Yeah, and I don't think that's the worst thing, you know, to do that. I mean, like I said, a lot of stuff is floating in the air more than you, <laughs> <laughs> more than you would like to admit, let's say, so. Yeah. <laughs> And then a lot, of, a lot of the venues like around the country that putting a big emphasis on like, obviously, because it's going to be mass gatherings sooner than later. Mm-hmm. So hand sanitizer stations, you know, the air gets cycled more through the HVAC systems and all this kind of stuff, more touchless, like hand wash sinks and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Why not? I mean, nobody wants to be sick. It, it goes more than coronavirus. Right now, COVID-19 is, you know, the focus, but really it's everything i mean you yep. can get you could touch a elevator knob and get <laughs> some crazy stuff man yeah. so fingers crossed but let's see let's see how it comes out in, in kitchens as well you know if like face covering is going to be the new norm you know i haven't cooked a eight hour shift on the line wearing a mask i'm guarantee you it's not a a nice experience yeah. but i mean if that's what it is that's what it is right so right so i'll, go, I'll come home from work and i'll be cooking dinner and I feel like I'm missing something because I'm not wearing my gloves that I'm required to have at work or like I'm not wearing a mask and I'm like, this, something's going to happen to me even though I'm in my own home. <laughs> well, see, she's kind of a newbie though. She I just got this job. So yeah. when she says something like that, I, I was always a gloves guy. I only oh, had, yeah, I think one place I worked at, which is uh, KFC was the only place where we didn't necessarily have to have gloves. Especially when we were cooking the chicken, believe it or not, because it was going to get cooked, fried. Yeah. Yeah. So when we were tossing it, you could use your own hand. In fact, sometimes it was like you have to use your own hands because you got to get that bread in there. You know what I'm saying? But I was always the gloves guy, regardless, even though when you're tossing the chicken, it gets all in your gloves. It's gross. But it's the same thing. Like if you if you clean, like, I don't know, tenderloins or whatnot, you know. You don't necessarily have to wear a glove, but it's, I don't want to have blood under my fingernails, like all over my hands, you know, like meat juices, you know, so I just put yeah. gloves on, you know, but it's definitely, the glove wearing is definitely an American thing in kitchens. Like if you, is it Europe, really in Europe, you don't see that many gloves. You know? Really? Yeah. But you guys are, it's cleaner over there almost. Well, I'll give you a good example. Like the last place I worked in Germany was a five-star hotel in Munich. And we had a hand wash, I call it a robot. So it's a thing mounted on the wall in the kitchen and it's hooked up to the chef computer. So you, a certain amount of times a day within a shift, you have to walk to this hand machine, the hand washing machine, put in your pin number and then it washes your hands for you, right? And if you don't do that, the chef in the office gets an alert Right, oh, they say, like, "Hey, this person hasn't washed their hands in that in like that long." Right, so and it's all touchless. You put it in there, it washes your hands, sanitizes your hands, it gives you a green light, and you're good to go. 
right? It's same as in, you walk in the kitchen <clears throat> in Europe, there's like, it looks like a big floor mat, but it's soaked in sanitizer solution, right? So you automatically sanitize the soles of your, your shoes the moment you walk into the kitchen, right? So it's little things, right? But it's yeah. different. Let's see here, we thought, me as an American, I thought, oh, we're advanced. But then I hear about this and I'm like, we don't even use bidets yet in America. Not like widely, you know what I'm saying? And like the first time I ever went to a foreign country, first thing I get hit with is a bidet. I was like, <laughs> what is going on, man? America is behind the curve. I actually lived in Germany for a bit when I was a kid. I think like almost four years, like it was three years and a few months. And I don't really remember anything because I was so young. I don't really recognize the cultural differences. Um, but I actually was going to go back to Europe and then my school trip got canceled and my mom was going to take me to Europe after I graduate. And I think that's going to get postponed a few years until everything goes back to normal, normal. But um, yeah, I really wish I could remember all the like, cultural, like little nuances yeah. that differ I'm, in the U.S. It's all Western countries, right? So there's a Western yeah. civilization, but mm -hmm. I think the small, I think Germans are more direct than Americans. Right, like I'm saying, yeah. Germans, like Germans, Swiss, Austrians, like those German countries, right? I do remember hearing that one. Yeah, we're pretty direct, you know. Like most, what I hear from German tourists when they come to the U.S. and they go, go to a mall, there's like this whole when you walk into the store, hey, how are you today? You know, this like <laughs> people are thrown up, but it was like, hmm? why? <laughs> so wait, what do you mean? What is what is it like in Germany? Then you walk I mean, into the you know, it's like, it's more straightforward. You know, you go to a store and you buy shoes, right? Uh -huh. You don't have to have a conversation with the, with, the, oh, with, the, yeah. with the store, with the associate, like talking five day, five minutes about how your day is going, right? So That's so <laughs> funny because, you know, most people would say it's a little nicer. Like the people are nicer, friendlier over yeah, in it's, foreign countries. Well, they're more sincere, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because America, you know, it's we've we've loaded over here with all this, you know, stuff and all this drama. We got so much going on that, yeah, it's hard to be straightforward here. Yeah, <laughs> but in the kitchen, it's the kitchen is a pretty straightforward place, right? So, yeah, there's always time to talk about it, but but it's go time, it's go time, and it's usually, I'm still a firm believer in like you know, there's a time when it's just a yes chef. Right, and you can always talk about it afterwards. But if stuff needs to get done, stuff needs to get done. Right, so that's what I loved about food service for sure. You nailed it right there. Like I just love how it's like everyone can come in and like we got to get this done. You know, like eight hours goes by like that usually because you're just going. It it's not like what should I do now? It's like oh I know what I should do. Oh there's a break okay, I'm sanitizing down, I'm cleaning something, I'm wiping some, I'm washing my hands, I'm getting prepared for the next wave, something like that. And that's why I love everybody comes together. Yeah, which is great, right? And I think if everybody would do what they want doing service, right? Or like, let's say we have a prep day for a sold out like Nuggets Lakers game, right? If everybody would do what they want or what in the mood for, right? It wouldn't get done, right? So there always needs to be some clear direction coming from the top have you had jobs where you walked in and it was kind of like nobody was in a professional setting and you were like I don't know if this is for me well, I think I'm, I was pretty fortunate that I always worked in like pretty high-end or like professional places and if I would see that in the kitchen I would just walk back out because it's not gonna happen <laughs> yeah it usually starts with the cleanliness too then right you see yeah. that if you walk in a place like this where it's kind of like a free for all that those are not the most clean places and I'm, I'm a bit of a clean freak when it comes to kitchens i hate cluttering kitchens you know clutter is like the worst i'm a bit old school when it comes to music and kitchens too mm -hmm. not a big fan of the if the bluetooth speakers are blasting it goes in with the whole you know let's yeah. focus here right we have yeah. a job to do right if there, there's there's always a time and place you know if somebody is in a by themselves and cleans 400 pounds of beef tenderloin yeah listen to music doesn't bother me but if there's 20 other people around and the message needs to come across and then there's music blasting it kind of throws everything off <laughs> i mean like, i did my apprenticeship from 98 until 2001 and my first executive chef like he was old school yeah, uh, yeah. 
if he would call out the check and you wouldn't respond back, like you had something flying in your towards your direction, right? Oh so, yeah. Oh no. Oh yeah. You better, oh yeah. You better pay attention, right? And you're an 18 year old, and you're like, okay, yes, chef. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, then, yeah. And then I had yeah. a, I had the, the <laughs> exec Sue was French, and he liked to call out the checks in French. So oh, you better gosh. understand. Because I mean, the whole setup in European kitchens is different too. You don't have like a saute yeah. line. You don't have a fry station. You have your like, you have your saucier, you have your entremet, you have your garbage. So it kind of comes together. A, a dish comes together differently than mm -hmm. in an American kitchen, but everything flows towards the past. When you have your sous chef, usually with another guy who plates plates the dishes, right? But if you cook an entremet, you never plate a dish. Like if you have pasta. On your section or vegetable sides you have to prepare you go after the guy who's cooking the fish or the meat right he's calling the shots right so if he yeah. tells he's four minutes out on the meat or the fish then you better make sure that your sides are ready at the same time right yeah i feel like the timing is the most key thing yeah. i feel like i mess up a little bit i'm obviously newer i've only been in my job um for three months but it's like the timing and it's just like a little sandwich station. I work at Dunkin' Donuts and the timing is just what scares me the most. Yeah, and then, I mean, I've never, I haven't worked in an environment like this for probably 10, 12 years, but it's it's so instilled in me, it will never go away, right? So. Have you cooked a lot of tenderloins? In my in my life? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can tell, man, you keep <laughs> You keep talking about the tenderloins. I knew they were either your favorite or you just cooked a lot of them. I cut a lot of them up. In my life. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, well, I think the biggest function was probably for like 4,000 people, tenderloin. 5, uh -huh. So that's a lot of meat. That's a lot of yeah, meat. Yeah, that's <laughs> nuts. Yeah. And right. did you get them all right? I'm pretty good when it comes down to like cleaning and portioning meat. I usually do competitions with my cooks. You know, uh -huh. I put it I put a 20 on the table and let's let's see who's quicker and more precise. I have one chef friend and when he hears, oh, I want it well done, he cringes, he says. Because he's like, <laughs> beef should not be that way. He's a rare person. He says 140. He something like I'm taking it off 130, letting it rest 10 minutes, done. He's rare. I'm not emotionally attached to it because at the end of the day, like you pay, if you go to a restaurant and you drop $55 for a steak, right? If you want it raw, you can have it raw. It's not my concern, right? At the end of the day, you're paying for it and you want to eat it how you want to eat it. So if you want it well done, you know, so be it, you know? <laughs> That's but one even, way to, I like that. That's what I was trying to argue for. I was like, man. Because it's an argument you're never going to, it's an argument you're never going to win. What are you going to do? You're going to go out in the dining room and argue with the guests that, you don't agree with their temperature choice in a steak. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I get it. Like some people don't like it and to cook it, but at the end of the day, it's like, you're not paying for it. The person's paying mm -hmm. for it. So, Well, what yeah. do you think? What do you personally get your steaks done at? I'm a medium guy. I used, really? to eat medium, I used to eat it medium rare for the longest time, but like recently I changed to medium. I had never done rare before until I started cooking my own steaks. And then I did it rare and I was like, okay, I kind of understand. This, it, all this might be the, it. it all depends on the cut too, right? I mean, if you have a big old piece, like eight ounce. Yes. Tenderloin is like this big. It's, I don't think it's a pleasant experience to eat that like rare. Yeah. Right? I mean, most people don't get it right if it's rare, right? Uh huh. So it's just straight up raw. Right? Yeah. No, yeah, because it's so thick. It's just, you know, if somebody wants to eat a, you know, I mean, I've seen people eat a porterhouse blue. You know, all you do is like you warm it up under the window uh -huh. lamp, and then you just kiss it on the grill, and that's it. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, it's like whatever the guest wants, really. You know. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're we're, we're providing a service, right? Mm -hmm. And so they come to experience what they want to experience, and it's it's their call yeah absolutely you know if they if they if they tell me to put the piece of halibut in the deep fryer i'll put it in the deep fryer for them if, if, if that's what they want you know yeah that's awesome i mean that's the best way to look at it but for sure I think like this whole it's a it's an ego thing you know and i think as a chef if you at some point you need to drop the ego oh uh, yeah you know? for sure because i mean i've worked plenty of 
I mean, the place I worked in, in Miami, we had the South Beach for the Wine Festival, and we hosted the the event is called Best of the Best. It was hosted at the Fountain Blue, and usually we usually got about fifty celebrity chefs for like one event, and you see all these. Some of these guys don't get it, and they still have the attitudes, and yeah. the, you know, it's like <laughs> you think you're surrounded by a bunch of rock stars and stuff, and it's like. All right, let's just cook food here. Right? Some yeah. people get it, you know. There's some people are very, very humble, but I think like staying humble and staying approachable and not being a diva, I think it's definitely very, very important. You know, you don't want to yeah. walk into the kitchen. You don't want to walk into your kitchen and people being intimidated. You know, I'm. Yeah. That's not what I who I am. You know, and I don't. So think you're you saying being a good person is is key to being a good chef. Yeah, I mean, there's the three Fs, right? Firm, fair, friendly, right? Yeah. But I treat everybody with the same respect. It doesn't matter if you're a dishwasher or if you just do your rounds and pick up the trash. I mean, we're all human beings, you know? And if, Yeah, if that's they, how it should be. If yeah. that's the route you, you, you took in your life and you're content with that, I mean, so be it, you know? I'm not here to change your life, you know? I'm, yeah. you know, I'm not your counselor, right? So as long as you treat me with respect, I treat you with respect. Right. And usually I think it's also very important if you're a boss and it might sound funny, but to start it, I call it an emotional bank account. Mm. Right. So if you're a new chef somewhere and you go in like guns blazing and you go, want, I want this, 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 it's not going to work. Right. It's going to be resistance. Right. So you have to build an emotional bank account. Mm. Um, so, you know, do little favors. If somebody asks you, Hey, chef, I really need to stay off and you can make it happen in the schedule, make it happen. You know, what's, what's, it's not going to matter to you, right? If it's possible, it's possible. If it's not possible, just have an honest conversation. It's like, look, this is the business for the day. You know, we have a back-to-back abs nuggets game that can't give you the day off, right? And people understand it, right? It's all about com- communication. And then once you deposit into this bank account, if it's withdraw time, it was like, hey, I need you to work a double. You know, I need you to stay a little bit longer. Then it's usually a lot easier, right? So you have to, you have to create that emotional connection with people and be sincere about it, you know? I worked with yeah. people before and they every single time you see them, they just ask you, how's the family, right? Mm. It's just a, a question, how's the family? And so even if you tell them about the family, next time you ask them, hey, by the way, I told you yesterday how many siblings I have and they don't remember how many siblings they had, that you have, then, you know, it's not sincere, right? Just be yeah. sincere, you know? And, you know, you don't always, you're not always in a good mood, you know? I mean, just be, be yourself, right? And do you think that's the European in you? Because surely when you came to America, it was like not sincere, though. Mm-hmm. I, I, don't think, I think it's just being a, a trying to be a good boss. Right? Yeah. Being a chef and like trying to have like a team spirit going. And not everybody, like I said, not everybody being worried about when you walk in the kitchen. You know, I mean, you have to have a presence as a chef, but don't lead by fear, you know. That's yeah. how I see. It's just being, being, yeah, being sincere, being good with your people. You know. Yeah. If so your employees them, really like you, then, because <laughs> you sound pretty good. You sound. I want you as my boss, man. I, I hope so. I mean, I really hope so. I wouldn't. When they're back, ask them. Come in, ask them. Right. But yeah. trying to trying to treat everybody with the same amount of respect. You know, like I said, doesn't matter what position you have. We're all human beings. And so, you know, if 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 there needs to be a stern talk, there needs to be a stern talk. But that's just what it is. Yeah. You know, if somebody look, if you if you overcook two hundred pounds of prime rib for the second time, we're gonna have a conversation, right? But yeah. I mean, it's in every job, it's like that, right? If you, you know, my first boss, you can always make a mistake, but just don't make the same mistake twice, right? Because then it becomes yeah. disrespectful, <laughs> especially if you had a conversation about your first mistake. How do you how to address it and how to avoid that mistake and you still make it and it becomes it starts to become disrespectful right yeah absolutely and yeah. you have you haven't always um cooked in bulk like this or have you always like um, what kind of drew you to this i switched to the banquet side when i started working in the fountain blue in miami beach okay uh, which is like a high-end hotel but a very very large banquet operation for like a yeah. miami beach hotel i mean it has 1500 rooms but huge banquet space, very, very high end. And I kind of got a kick out of it. You know, it's also, yeah. if, you, if you work on the banquet conference with sports side, 
your hours are usually a lot better. It's Is not, it? It's not that you work less, but it's it's not very common that you walk out of the kitchen at one o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, way. surely. Right. I mean, we still don't get me wrong. We still work crazy hours, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like you usually done by like nine. No, if it's nine nine thirty, it's usually when you and I'm at a point in my life that I don't need to be in the kitchen in the until like one o'clock or one thirty in the morning and live the you know live the rock star lifestyle you know go to the bar yeah. afterwards with with your colleagues and stuff it's it's gonna catch up me after a while yeah you know? yeah I've done it been there got the t shirt you know so <laughs> and it's I think it's it's it broadens your horizon a little bit. You know, because if you're a restaurant chef, you you worked. Yes, you change your menus, but you run the same 15 dishes or 20 dishes for mm -hmm. months at a time, right? Yeah. Same as same for a cook. You know, if you work in a station, a restaurant, and let's say you work sides or whatnot, a sandwich station, you do the same five, six, seven different dishes day in day out. Usually, a banquet menu is 50 pages deep, right? So, you know. There's a lot more you can do, and you cook a lot more different food than you would do in a restaurant, right? I mean, you have theme nights, you have receptions, you have buffets, you have plated dinners, right? And it's also, I get a kick out of it of um, making sure that we feed thousands and thousands of people in a short amount of time, right? It's it's a pretty big accomplishment, like they. Yeah. Um, right? For sure. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, man, you're talking about, I think you said 400 pounds of tenderloin early. I was yeah, like, yeah, well, I was I mean, like, that's easy, right? I mean, let's say you do a plate of dinner for a thousand people and you have, you serve a six or seven ounce beef tenderloin as an entree, right? So you have a 45% yield on a tenderloin. You do the math on how much, how much beef you have to bring in, right? Yeah. So like in that case, sounds crazy. In that case, how many hours of prep work are you doing before, like, say the the food needs to get out at like six o'clock at night? How many hours of prep work are you doing? Well, it it really depends on your business leading up to it. I'm talking, I'm talking. Let's say you work. In, I'm not talking about arenas now. Let's say you work in a large banquet operation, a hotel, right? It's not like that. You have days, and then it's just this one plate of dinner, and that's it. You have breakfast, lunches leading yeah. up to that dinner right so you kind of have to squeeze it in right so so is that what kind of draws you to it as well like i'm hearing it's not the same thing every day like it's always yeah. something different it's always something different right um it's different 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 customers you know different clientele you know like you get social events like weddings or big birthday parties and stuff so these people want something different again than your average corporate guest, right? It's therefore mm -hmm. a three-day convention, right? So it's a lot more uh, challenging too, I think. Yeah, and you got that adaptability too. So like, sounds like you're very well-rounded. Um, I think you need to get your, you have to make sure that you don't build a reverse um, pyramid, right? So your base needs to be solid, right? Okay. A solid solid base and then you work your way up and then you know you're not you're gonna be crumbled because if you don't have your if you don't know your stuff in the kitchen sooner or later you're gonna get called out uh -huh. right? Yeah. right so you better make sure you have a solid solid foundation right but that foundation nobody can ever take away from you right because it just gets plowed into your head this is how you make a demi glass or this is how you fillet a piece of like a, a halibut or whatnot it, it's never going away. It's like riding a bicycle, right? You might not be the fastest if you have, haven't if, if you haven't filleted a whole fish for five years, but you still know what's going on, right? Yeah. But on the banquet side, I think it's it's also like the responsibility is a lot bigger, right? Because let's say he even here, right? We cook for seventeen thousand people, or let's say a banquet mm -hmm. banquet event for two thousand people. You're not going to mess up one entree. You're messing up two thousand entrees. Yeah. yeah. So in a restaurant, if you overcook a steak, the one plate comes back, okay, you do a refire, right? You send a dessert mm -hmm. out for free and call it a day. Yeah. If we overcook 2,000 pieces of beef, we're in trouble, right? Yeah. You look, yes, you right? are. <laughs> you know what, though? I'm so glad 
a little detail you put in there was send the dessert out for free. I'm so glad you said that because I am very much like I've always been that type of person where it's like, if we mess something up, give them something for free. That's the way I look at it. I understand yeah. that, you know, we got to keep our profits high, but you shouldn't be messing up in my opinion. Cause I worked at this breakfast place for a little bit. And when we mess something up, they, you know, they just tried to, you know, they tried to get they away to get around it. it. Yeah. You know, like they weren't yeah. trying to make it right. I'm a make it right type of person. But here's the thing. A lot of people also know that. Right. So, you know, usually, I mean, I just mentioned the free dessert or you take an, an appetizer off the check or whatnot. It's usually, the, but a lot of people know that too and take advantage of that. Right. So do you know, you know, what KFC is I'm guessing. Yeah. So one thing that KFC gave me, I hate, I worked there for a long time, so, but I hate to say this, but one thing KFC gave me was apparently one of the Colonel's famous quotes is if they have to lie about it, they need it more than you. So that, that was like our thing. So like if, if you were lying about what your food was or how it was, then that means you needed it for free more than we needed it, the profit from it. So that's kind of how I look at things now. Like if you really have to come in and lie to me or about it, then then that's what you need more than I need it because I don't need to lie about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a good approach. I like that. I mean, it's probably not the best for profits, you know. But no, yeah, but how often this is going to happen? You know, yeah. I mean, you're still going to hit your profit margin if you let's say if you do 400 covers in a restaurant a night and you comp whatever 10 apps and five desserts is not going to break the bank, right? Yeah. Yeah. And usually people feel appreciated too. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not coming from like in Europe, it's not common to tip, right? It's I've not. heard about that. I didn't know if that was a myth or not. No, it's, I mean, you, I mean, maybe you leave a few like little, like a little change or whatnot, but it's not like, oh, 20% and you sit there with your calculator and do the math what the 20% is and all that. It's not like that, right? So I'm a firm believer in, in that tip has to be earned. I understand that these servers don't make a lot of money, like when they, they live off the tips, but it shouldn't give you yeah. an excuse to like provide like mediocre or subpar service. You know, you still yeah, did yeah. service, right? So it definitely reflects my tip and I don't feel bad about, I'm sorry to say it, but I don't feel bad about it. You know, if it's like really, really bad service, like it's just going to reflect in my tip. I'm sorry. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when you I know, I think it's kind of an American thing too. They needed yeah. an incentive to like to like start treating people better and giving yeah. them better service. That's and exactly I, what I was about way, to say. The other way around is the same. You know, if, if services goes above and beyond or is like excellent and on point, like reflects mm -hmm. my tip on positive, positive as well. So yeah, you know, so I'm I'm a firm believer in that. You still have to earn your money. Yeah, yeah. of course. And food service definitely makes you earn your money. Like, that's what I like about it. You know, you you got to work hard, man, because yeah. you can't just come in there and lollygag. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I think it took me at least 15 years throughout my career to like until I started making decent, decent money. You know, you just have to stay focused, mm -hmm. you know, and look at the long-term goal of what you want to achieve. You know, I didn't make a lot of money, but I was able to travel the world and work all, all around the world. You know, so that was kind of like the... It's a balance. And that's a common theme too, right? So, you know, because I don't know how it is in Germany. So I would love to hear your input. But I know here in America, especially, you know, because we have celebrity chefs and it's like really fantasized about. So a lot of people think I'm going to go to school and I'm going to come out making over six figures a year. Yeah. I'm going to be a celebrity chef. You know, people are going to love me. I'm going to make all this money. And that, why not be a chef, you know? Culinary yeah, yeah. school is like, whoa, like, let's do it type thing. How is it in Germany, though? Um, I think it's, like, it's the, the hard floor of reality, you know? It's like, like I said, you need to build your base, you know? And I've met plenty of, like, Johnson Wales, and I don't want to call out any schools, but, like, and they do their, <laughs> their bachelor degree, and then they come out and they think they're a sous chef. I was like, no, you're not. Yeah, you have to build. You have I, to build I have 15 up. cooks in my kitchen. They can cook you against the wall with their left hand, right? Uh -huh. So, yeah. like, and I have a, I used to have honest conversations with them. You know, I bring you in as a commie, right, and see how it goes. But you're not a sous chef. Just because yeah. you have a degree doesn't mean you're a sous chef. You know? Yeah. See, there you go. So, 
I love that realism about and it, I, you know. And I think like fame, if if you're after fame, that comes naturally. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, like we live in a time with like social media and Instagram and whatnot, you know. Can you promote yourself? Absolutely, promote yourself, right? Yeah, but and it takes it a should, personality. It should come too. naturally, you know. Like people should tell you how amazing your food is. You shouldn't have to tell people. You should. You shouldn't have to tell people how amazing <laughs> it is, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I would would say to most people is, you know, if you want to be a celebrity chef, you got to be a, good at cooking and you got to be an entertainer. You know, why do you yeah. like to watch Hell's Kitchen? It's because that Gordon Ramsay, man, he's entertaining you. You know, you're yeah. laughing. You're like, I can't believe this is this is so crazy. You know what I mean? That's true. But again, like if are you into entertainment or you want to just cook good food, right? And that's yeah, something. that's what I'm saying. You know, you either got to cook or you got to entertain. You know, and if you got both, then there you go. Yeah, I mean, you look at these Michelin star chefs in Europe, right? Yeah. Or even the U.S. You don't see a Thomas Keller in the on TV a lot uh-huh. of times, or like a Daniel Hum from Eleven Madison. You don't see them in the news, right? Because in the no. kid is cooking, right? Yeah. Well, like, when you the eat business. their food, you're like, what the heck? This is crazy. Right. This and is so most, good. One of my best culinary experience in my life was eating at Eleven Madison in New York. You know. It's yeah. Just, it's borderline life changing. I think, you know, I'm just a big <laughs> That's fan. That's crazy. Of- I was going to ask you that too. Yeah. So, because these guys spend time developing the menus and like, you know, teaching people and being there, exec- executing the stuff. It's not just like other celebrity chefs and like, or celebrity chefs or a food network or whatnot. I mean, it, no, it works for them. Fair, fair enough. Right. But they, they run 25 different restaurants with four different concepts, you know, yeah. and how often are you going to be in a restaurant? You know, mm-hmm. and in the end of the day, you're putting your name on over that door. So, if I would if I would have my name on a restaurant, I would make sure that it's my name out there, right? So yeah. And is that ever your plan, or or do you just you like doing something else like this Legends? Um, Legends Hospitality is a great great company to work for, right? Uh-huh. It's a fairly young company. It was founded in 2008. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely like. Legends is pushing for a lot of venues nationwide, or actually worldwide. Big, big, big presence in Europe as well. Uh, we have Real Madrid and Manchester City. Then Once obviously- you got Madrid, yeah, that's awesome. And then with Cronky Sports, obviously, then um, FC Arsenal and all these places. So there's definitely room for growth. Um, and it's it is it is a corporate, right? It's a corporation but it's not like a cookie cutter corporate feel to it, right? Which is pretty rare in the sports and entertainment because you have other big companies that work there and it's like, this is what we do in every single venue. Here it's a lot more, um, the, you drive, like, I mean, we understand we cannot serve the same food in Denver than we can serve in LA, right? It's yeah. just a good clientele, right? So it's a lot more like local driven. Um, Sacramento is doing a great job. We have the, um, the Sacramento Kings and even on their concessions level, they don't source any products further away than I think it's 85 miles away from the stadium. So That's crazy. It is insane. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like local produce and stuff. So it's a, it's a great approach, you know, and you, you can be pretty creative when it comes to things, right. And you can go out there because if you think about it, it's not like in a hotel that people come there for three days and, oh, I have this work conference and I don't really want to go. People come here to have fun, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And they're already come in a good mood. Because, like, yeah, we're about to see a great hockey game or great basketball game and it's entertainment. So you can play a lot with the food too towards that, right? Which I think excites me, you know? It was like, and you just think like, what do you want to eat when you go to like a, a sports event? You know, what would be cool? right so a tenderloin steak man (laughs) now you got me (laughs) craving one to be honest we have a prime rib sandwich on the second on the the club level you know oh what so you got the (laughs) that's i think my mom tried that actually and she wouldn't talk she wouldn't stop talking about it yeah so we, we, we do we do some cool stuff and i mean we just took the arena over or like we took over from our last company last beginning last season and this obviously this season was like ended a little bit prematurely, 
but it gave us a lot of like time to plan for upcoming seasons and so there's some cool stuff in the pipeline definitely and so covid didn't you know ruin everything for you guys you guys are still are you better than ever would you say coming um, out of this or i think in the long run yes right because usually you don't have a lot of time to plan yeah right? yeah it's just go 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 uh-huh and then now we actually have time to sit back and say okay let's see what we're doing right so Does you're planning mean? for when things go back to normal you're just yes. like way in events okay yeah. i mean we always had to take care of some stuff like okay like now it's starting next week we're going to feed the press and we're going to feed the um the security staff and whoever is here for a game without attendance right so there's obviously some like cdc guidelines you have to follow how can there's different zones right are you in touch with the team are you not in touch with the team mm -hmm. etc so but in the long term we're definitely looking at past covid right yeah. how can you enhance the experience past covid because we are still a firm believer in that this is all temporary obviously yeah, yeah. of course and we didn't have to invest obviously because we didn't have events we didn't have to invest in like you know sneeze scar like these like plexiglass yeah. things and mm -hmm. whatnot so well that that might might stay you know in like club level or whatnot you know all inclusive clubs it might stay right self-service buffet is probably going to go away mm -hmm. right? indefinitely right yeah because you don't want to go down a buffet line and use the same utensil that yeah people in front of you used right so yeah i mean i didn't even thing. think of that actually that's that's right? like one of those things because yeah like for sure they there's going to be some stuff that like kind of stays permanent at from this you know yeah, yeah. which I mean, like we it. said isn't always a bad thing yeah i mean if you if you take a step back and look at it it was like you really want to mm -hmm. eat the scoop your lettuce out yeah. of the same bowl that 85 people already scooped their lettuce out of from right is yeah. that something you really want to do or is there another way around it right so what is it instead? I, I can't. Is it just like you make it a meal and then they just grab a plate type thing? Or you do individual portions, right? Okay. So you can broaden the variety of stuff, right? Individual plates, you know, of being appetizers, being entree, and then obviously a lot more prepared by culinary staff in front of the guests, right? Okay. Right. So. Well, that's always nice. Right. So it's. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, instead of having a piece of meat, a piece of fish sitting in a in a in a chafing dish for thirty minutes, you know, it's yeah. nice if the, you know, one of the cooks prepares it for you, puts in a little plate, a little garnish, and then thank you very much. Right. Yeah. It's definitely a, up, a more upscale experience. Right. So I think yeah, self serve buffets are going away, definitely. Um, condiment carts, you know, the old condiment carts in stadiums and arenas, they're most likely yeah. going away for for good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, but that's pretty much the stuff we had to wrap our head around for now, but everything else is past COVID. Yeah, that kind of sucks. The, I always <laughs> like the condiment cards because I hate the little packets. I don't know if it's just <laughs> yes. me. I know, I know some I people, like they it. get the packets from McDonald's and they open it in a certain way where they can dip their fry like in the pack. It's so crazy, but I hate the packets. I don't know if that's just me, but I hate the packets. Yeah, it's a bit annoying. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like I'm wasting it because I don't get all of it out, I feel, and, you know, and I'm like, this sucks. Yeah, and the thing is, like, you have to also take, um, like, recycling all the stuff. Like, I mean, now during COVID, this whole, like, being green and eco-friendly kind of, like, went on a back burner, right? Yeah, no, for has, sure. Right, everything has to be packaged and whatnot, so... Uh -huh. Definitely have to be mindful of that too, that we don't just go all out with plastic and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, that's, that's funny because I, I was thinking really that think same about. thing. Really? Because I was like, everything's single use plastics right now. Well, yeah, gotcha. everything, right? So yeah. there's there's ways around it and we're definitely looking at that, especially with Ball being a new naming rights sponsor for the arena. Mm -hmm. um, big aluminum yeah. manufacturer, right? So. I don't know if you guys been to the arena last season. We already had the aluminum beer cups. Yeah. Yeah. Plastic beer cups. So that's like, that's a start. So there's a lot more stuff coming down the pipeline. Even when it comes to food packaging, there's like, like eco-friendly food packaging or biodegradable, yeah. like plastic cutlery and, and so on. So there's definitely some changes coming, which is great. You know, yeah, it is. But at the end of the day, it's always about the people too, you know, the, 
you yeah. would be surprised if you walk down the concourse and you see people, you know, there's a clearly marked aluminum cans only, you know, and you look yeah. at the end of the night, you're looking at trash and there's all kinds of things in there, right? So yeah, for sure. You really have to put it in the people's faces. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly had a lot of fun talking to you. I know Nate did, especially talking <laughs> about tenderloins forever. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I just enjoy it, man. You've been around. You've been around. You look, yeah. you got some wisdom to pass on, you know? Appreciate that. And, you know, a part of this podcast, you know, is not just to give the people listening some wisdom, but me as well. You know, I'm trying to learn as well. And you look like I could learn a bunch from, you, you know? Stay focused, guys. That's all it is, you know, and mark yourself a goal. What do you want to achieve? You know, and I know bosses always ask you, like, what I use like I love to ask people in the interview process like what do you see yourself in five years and it sounds like a silly question but like if you don't wait for your interview to think about it you know mm -hmm. think about yeah. it before what do you actually want to do I understand you guys are young people but where do you want to be in five years you know yeah and well yeah and part of that goes for those listening to what he just said you know when they ask you where do you want to be in five years that's not it's not a question to to, ha to get the answer from you that I want to be here in five years necessarily. That's not exactly what they want to hear when they ask that question. They want to see what your ambition is, what your goals are, and know that you have goals. And also keep in mind, people, that, you know, when they ask you that, based on your answer, they might be able to help you. You know, you have no idea what this person can do for you unless you put all your cards on the table and maybe they pick up one of those cards and say, I'll match this or I can, you know, do this for you. Yeah. Very true. Very, very true. And it's like, you know, if you work for somebody or if you apply for a job, then make sure that that person kind of is a mentor or like a trainer or like a, a guide for you as well. You know, because this is kind of like a, a good boss's responsibility too, you know, to train you and make, get you ready for get you ready for your next step right and for me it's always a the best sign for a chef is like the best compliment i think of you if you're a boss in general that nobody notices if you're there or not right mm -hmm. things run the same that's usually the best compliment and it can only be achieved if you have people in place they could jump in your position like if you would give your resignation it should for your higher ups there shouldn't be a question about who they're going to promote into your position because that person is already there and then, yeah. And they go from prep cook to line cook, right? If you work, if you start as a prep cook, and the mm -hmm. line leaves, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be hiring a line cook from the outside, right? Yeah, it should be you exactly. getting the promotion, right? Without you even having to ask for it, right? Yeah, it should be like a no brainer for the chef who's like, yeah, we move this person up. It's like a bit of a chess game, right? But it's kind of like putting your your starting your starting lineup together, right? As a chef, right? So that's really yeah. what it is, you know. And so, Chef Matt, if you could have one last thing to say to the young leaders of today, what would it be? Be sharp. And it starts from the in, in the interview process, application process, interview process. You know how you, like, how you. It's not only how you dress, but how you groom, how you present yourself. Right. Just have a professional approach. Really, like show the person you want that, right? So, you know, if if you see if the, if the chef is shaved every day, right, and has a clean jacket on and clean shoes, there's no reason why the prep cook can't do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, because so obviously if to see the chef being polished, then there's obviously something that he wants to see and in, in the kitchen. So, don't even don't even wait for that person to say, hey, how about shaving tomorrow? right? Just do it, you know, yeah. be professional. And then it sounds, sounds like these little things, but chefs notice that stuff or like bosses in general, they notice that, right? Just be professional. You know, if you go to an interview, nobody asks you to wear a suit. You're never going to wear a suit at work yeah. if you work in the kitchen, right? But just be presentable, right? Mm -hmm. Be on time, right? Because usually chefs are pretty busy and they're taking time out of their day to meet with you. Who is, it's not a given that you get the job, right? But it taking half an hour, an hour out of the day, to talk to you. So just be on time. You know, it's just a common courtesy, right? If I meet with my boss, I make sure I'm sitting out, outside the office five minutes prior, right? Mm -hmm. So it's nothing like out of this world, 
you know, just call me courtesy, you know, and be professional and figure out what you want to do, you know, but you have to know it to yourself and then tell your bosses what you want to do and then they can guide you in the right direction. Hello, everybody, and thank you for watching another episode of the Pineapple Podcast, where this week we got to talk to executive chef Matt Wallerlein. And if you want to keep up with him or Legends Hospitality, make sure you follow them on Instagram. Chef Matt's is going to be Chef Matt underscore Ballerina Denver. And then Legends is going to be The Legends Way. And if you wanted to keep up with the Pineapple Podcast, make sure to follow us at Pineapple Podcast CCIC on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So stay tuned.